Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Together with my co-host Joe Stewart, we speak with extraordinary movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. Before we dive in, we want to take a moment to acknowledge and honour the traditional owners of the unceded land where this episode was recorded, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our deepest respects to the elders both past and present and acknowledge the emerging leaders within their community. This episode, we are delighted to be speaking with Anjali Rao. Anjali is a writer, the host of the Love of Yoga podcast, president of the board of directors of Accessible Yoga, and as she shares in our conversation, is now beginning a doctorate of philosophy and religion with a concentration on women's spirituality a transdisciplinary program that delves into a feminist perspective and explores varied spiritual, ecological and political perspectives rooted in care for the earth, each other and the sacred. Anjali is an Indian American immigrant, a cancer survivor and believes that a dedicated practice of yoga in all its expansiveness can alchemize and heal the world by creating ripples of change within and around us. She offers an insightful and nuanced understanding to yoga stories and histories that have been obscured by Brahmanism, heteropatriarchy and colonization, as well as shining a light on how these forces affect our lives today. She brings a multidisciplinary approach, integrating yoga philosophy and history with storytelling, imagery and poetry. She brings an awe-inspiring depth of knowledge and potent critical insight to yoga history, which makes for an amazing conversation. But before we get to the interview, I'd like you to please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, or wherever you listen to your podcast. This really helps us reach a wider audience and lets Joe and I know that we are delivering the type of content that you want to hear. Because at the end of the day, we want to be of service to you, the listener. All right, let's get into our conversation with Anjali. All right, well, Anjali, thank you so much for speaking with us today. We we appreciate you spending the time to speak with us so much. So perhaps we could start with you just telling us a little bit about your background and where you grew up. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here with you both. I grew up in India, Bangalore which is a southern city. And I was there for 23 years of my life. I go back often. I am what I call what people uh, have a like a status as a person of Indian origin. And right now I'm an American citizen. I live here in the colonized land of the Ohlone, San Francisco Bay Area, California. And, you know, I consider myself both Indian and American for whatever that whatever that means. <laughs> yeah, so I, from what I do is I, uh, I'm i a practitioner of yoga, first and foremost, a student, and everything comes from that. It stems from that studentship. I'm a educator, I would say, sharing the histories of yoga uh, in context to the times, really bringing the teachings in context to the times that we live in. Yeah, so that's that's pretty much where I am. And yeah, I, I do other things. I, I'm a parent. I have a podcast, the Love of Yoga podcast, and currently I'm enrolled as a student in the PhD program, doctorate in uh, philosophy and religion from a feminist lens. So my work is really to unravel and deconstruct the power and privilege that runs through the teachings, and which is a microcosm of the larger systems historically and to the present moment. So that's that's pretty much in a nutshell what I do. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all of the educating that you do through all of your online sharing because you've really opened my eyes to the full richness of the yoga tradition and just what a narrow facet I've been taught in my training and in a lot of other texts that I've read. Mm -hmm. And I love that your approach to sharing is also so multidimensional and so creative. Like it's a really, like you're talking about the microcosm and the macrocosm. It's like you're opening up our understanding, but it's also not just told through one viewpoint. It's really about sharing a lot of perspectives. And I know that how the caste system has really 
impacted so many aspects of society, but also our understanding of the teaching and practice of yoga. Would you like to start unpacking a bit of that? Mm. Yeah, oh, we're diving right in. You're not <laughs> kidding. <laughs> First of all, I have to position myself and locate myself as a person with caste privilege, which means that uh, as a person who has been conditioned to regard the caste system as an inevitable part of society, I had to really understand where that falls in my own psyche and in my own conditioning. And it's something that I've always challenged growing up in India. And I felt that that this is not what liberation is, at least for a lot of people. And even as a person with caste privilege, how am I enacting that in my own life? So to answer your question, the caste system, I would I would really lo- love for people to listen to the podcast that I had with Tenmori Sandararajan and uh, Prachi Patankar in the Love of Yoga podcast, because they are from, they are both Dalit and Bahujan activists who are really working in the fields of uh, caste abolition. And in yoga, uh, it, it uh, the development of yoga and the development of caste almost happened at the same time. So it's kind of very integrated. Not many people know about it because the people who have taught us come from Brahminical scholar, the scholar caste lineage. So obviously that is sort of invisibilized and there is a strong thread of uh, patriarchy as it manifests in, in caste, in the caste system, especially in the, in the, uh, the two, the three castes in the hierarchy, which is the priest, scholar, caste, as well as the warrior caste, that's a kshatriya, and then there is a merchant caste. And this is a vast simplification because we, what we are talking right now is what we call as the Varna system. So it basically started off as a division of labor 3,000 years ago. And I would say 2,500 to, yeah, around 2,500 to 3,000 years ago. And it then became this very uh, rigid structure where as newer migrants came into the region, the Indic Valley region, Harappan region, civilization, the Indo-Aryans, that's when the caste system came in to what we now call as modern day Afghanistan, Pakistan and India. So they bring in the stratification system based on a division of labor after nomadic people settling into agricultural communities. You know, so think about it. You need somebody to do the farming, somebody to protect the farming, somebody to, you know, have some sort of a government structure, then somebody to trade. So they, it started off as that and it was far more fluid and then it sort of get got more rigid as newer migrant waves come in. And there was a lot of intermingling. There was conflict. There was coexistence. There was all of that. And what what we consider the caste system now is actually what we call as the jati, which is literally it means by birth. That means you're born into a jati, and then you have to like you. That's your that's your identity. So what we call right now are actually the jati system, not the varna system. That's the big umbrella term. So jatis are basically endogamous groups. It started coming in where they couldn't get married between each other they couldn't be you know and that creates a very strict rigid structure for people to not move in society access to resources access to spiritual resources access to yogic teachings all of that comes in because of the caste system it's it's everywhere it's invisible it's in the air we breathe and because uh, you know the, in the caste Caste is sort of invisible also because all of us look the same. It's not like a black person versus, versus a brown person and a white person. It's a very visible sort of a, you know, difference. So here, only the people who are in the group kind of know who is which caste in, because of the name or something like that. So it's sort of insidious and it's invisible. And it's that's why it's very challenging to unearth. And uh, that's why it's also very harmful. And it's one of the oldest, it is the oldest stratification, social stratification systems in the world so in the in terms of yoga it, first of all it's nobody much understands where it, what it means like what does that mean and where is it lying and so it's there everywhere S- sanskrit was a language which was uh, accessible only for or was a language of the elite it was a language of the brahmins the, the scholars as well as the kshatriyas and to a certain extent the merchants but 
typically those were the people who kind of protected the language. So all the, the oral compositions of the Vedas and the Upanishads, Upanishads were slightly more egalitarian because it took the, it distilled the rituals, rustic, very, you know, Brahminical teachings of the Vedas. And then it became the Upanishads and added to it from the ascetic traditions. So where does caste come in into yoga spaces? Through the beginning, because it sort of evolved around the same time. It, so, and then in the modern mo- moment, we have people, you know, from all over the world enacting those things again without knowing that they are actually perpetuating the, the harm from caste. But for example, let's say even, le- I'm not even going to go back 2,500 years, because that's a lot. Even if you say, like, say, past 200 years, you know, my friends always make fun of me. They're like, okay, when Anjali starts talking about history, she really talks about, like, when people were making stone tools. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, really talking about long ago. so when you're talking about, like, 200 years ago, Krishnamacharya, who was, like, the, the sort of so-called father of modern yoga, because he really created this system of teachings which were then dispersed through his students Ayangar, Pattabhi Joyce, Desikachar and all of those and Indra Devi who was a white yoga teacher who was the only woman quote-unquote foreigner who learned from him in Mysore and then she goes to LA and then she starts her school and then it starts getting spread so that's one big lineage with so many people learning from this one root teacher who was a Brahmin and he was he, he was uh, his patron was the ruler of mysore so he's a kshatriya you know so this is uh, it's a, it's such a big part of our the quote unquote one very strong stream of the yogic tradition that people are not aware of and my task in my work is to really look at some of that and really ask the questions rather than say, okay, this part is Brahminical and this part is not Brahmin. It's very hard to divide that. And my question is, how, wh- where was it? How was it located? What was the social context? What was the political context around that teaching? And then how is that now translated and practiced? And so am I correct in thinking that the caste system was like further made rigid and enforced through colonization and through British yes. British occupation as a way of kind of dividing and conquering local people and elevating yeah. some groups and then further yeah. diminishing the power of others. Yes. And it's so interesting as well because that lineage that you're talking of, those are all the books that I read for my yoga teacher training. And yeah. it's almost shared in the way of like, oh, this is how it happened. And it's like, well, this is how it happened for one small group of people, but who are we not hearing from? Yeah, absolutely. And yes, absolutely. So the caste system always existed. It's not true that, you know, the British created the caste system. British institutionalized it. They made it a part of governance. They made it a uh, part of the censorship. So till then, we did not have a person checking in a box saying, okay, I belong to a certain caste or a jati. That never really came into the administration governance part of it, though it was a part of the system. It was a part of the economic system of a particular region. And each region had their own laws. And so in come the British and they see this mind-boggling array of people doing all kinds of things, praying to all kinds of gods, eating all kinds of food. So they were like, how do we do this? And they had one group of people who are definitely not like the other group of people, which is the Muslims. So they had one law for the Muslims. Uh, they, they kept the shari- Shariat law. And then they had looked at the other groups and they said, anybody who's not a Muslim is a Hindu. And so that came into the picture. And then then they were like, okay, how, how do we like govern this big group of people who are all Hindus? They all have like this thing which is the Manusmriti, which is one of the books they actually translated I think in 1700 and something 90 1790 something like that so it they actually translated this book which is a Manava Dharma Shastra Manusmriti which talked about caste that was really not used for governance until then the governance for each region like I said was very topical it was very done it was done by what we call as a panchayat, where the village or the region had had a say in 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 law and justice. 
So in come th- these people, they used one book and they said, okay, we are going to base a lot of our laws for governing you all based on this one book, which talked a lot about caste system and each person's role in each caste and all of that. So that sort of created this institutionalization of caste that persists today and impacts every part, every realm of our life. And to follow on from what you've been saying about ha- like whose voices are heard and shared, another yeah. massive s- section of society who we don't hear from in history books are women and non-binary and trans people. Would you like to unpack a little bit about the role that people who aren't men might have played in yoga history and practice and sharing and some of the reasons why their voices weren't recorded in the same way? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So caste operated or or rather patriarchy operated within the caste system. So Brahmin, the scholar Brahmin women were you know, it the it is a bit it was a patriarchal system, but within the four three four castes, the top three four castes, the rest of the castes, which were are also people who are outside the caste system, which were the Dalit, the Adivasi, the tribal, the indigenous people, they had their own way of operating. You know, so to answer your question, why are women and non-binary practitioners, for example, if you look at history, why do we not hear of them? It's a huge, long reason also, and I've done a whole podcast on it. But one is Brahminical, so-called, you know, Brahminical patriarchy, which is uh, where the, the scholars who were the upholders of the, you know, the, the teachings, which was based in Sanskrit, they could they were the only ones who could do that. They could pass on from a student, a teacher, teacher to a student through Sanskrit. And that was not, taught to the women for a, maybe for a for a while though they were female ascetics and all of that during the vedic times but then they start, started getting less and less as more people come in from different parts of the region you know so that's one of the reasons is brahminical patriarchy patriarchy operationalizing in the caste system and two is that legitimacy of the written word, right? So the while the Brahminical patriarchy were ha- do, you know, created this very oral tradition that then got written written down, it and it was done in Sanskrit, which was not available to the to the women and non-binary practitioners or the femme practitioners. The the oral traditions were kept alive. The oral traditions were kept alive in the vernacular languages, in the regional languages, in in forms of Sanskrit, which were not in elitist forms. So Sanskrit then had like different forms. So that was then kept alive by women. And because it was not written down, it was not considered to be legitimate. It was not considered, it was considered to be quote unquote folk. Right. And the, the, the re, for example, the retellings of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, the two great, what we call as epics or itihasa, they were told, retold, uh, enacted dramatically through dance, through music and all of that. That was done in, in many ways by people who are not accessing or could not access the Sanskrit written down, very formal sort of, you know, work. So women and femme, that's why we don't know much of them or they are just footnotes. So people, it's 20, uh, I think 27 Rishikas, Rishikas are female femme ascetics are mentioned in the Vedas, for example, the root sort of the quote unquote, the root compositions from a big stream of people because there was Tantra happening at the same time. Tantra was a very rural quote unquote again. When I say rural, I don't mean like, uh, when I say rural, I mean, all these things which we are talking about was existing in the urban town centers, right? But there was also people who were living on the fringes of those tra- tra- town centers or in the forests who were doing their, who had their own system. And those kind of practices, traditions get then coalesced in tantra traditions. And that was not for the longest time. And again, now it's been totally co opted by Brahminism as well as white supremacy and capitalism and all of that but for the longest time the the a lot of the tantric uh, lineages coalesced and it was a far more egalitarian practice and tradition not much hierarchy 
and also people could get initiated into some of those traditions from a proper teacher like there was an actual process of getting into those traditions and lineages and not necessarily only men so it's really a vast complex thing and so i think what what is the problem now is that we are oversimplifying not only asana i think asana is also being oversimplified but in general yoga and only when you start looking at the history you realize how complex it all was and and how homogenized it is now so right now you know i had a teacher once and i always say this that right now asana i'm sorry yoga has been reduced to asana asana has been reduced to a uh, downward dog and downward dog you know and then that has been reduced to your uh, hamstring flexibility like it is just like that uh, there is hardly any um space given for complexity in in the teachings and in a YTT or a continuing education program and we really need to look at history to really realize how we are where we are right now how did for example if you start looking at like like you mentioned why don't we hear about women and uh, fem and non binary practitioners in our history and it's exactly those same systems that are still prevailing today and in all the different realms right so the same systems of power and privilege operate within the yoga space that are reflected or that are reflections of the outside of the yoga space and it's so interesting as well because there are gender fluid deities within those epics and Absolutely. kind of key characters who like live those identities and yeah it's really interesting yeah. hearing from you about the disconnect between yeah. how it was or one one view of how it was and what we see now. And yeah. could we even go a little bit more is into the Gokula system? Is that how I pronounce it, which is the kind of going to the guru's house and yeah. learning for like maybe 10 years or a long time? And one of the description I've read of it is it's actually like an example of socialist education because it's like an educational system that's kind of supported by the rest of the village. So it kind of would make that life of study more accessible or is that something of an idealized view that I picked up and maybe it was only a small <laughs> selection of people who were able to kind of go and live and study and learn and immerse themselves in knowledge for that time? Well, that's a very good question. So guru, the Gurukul, that's what it's called. Guru is a you know teacher and uh, so it's a school within a forest or like on the fringes of a village or um, a urban center so a lot of all of what you said has happened where it was kind of like so gurukul or an ashram where a teacher where a student would go to a teacher stay with the teacher for like at least 10 years learn everything under the sun and the moon and the stars and the trees about the scriptures and the texts about the body about taking care of the uh, farm and the cows and archery and horse riding and uh, you know all of that right maybe not horse riding cattle riding <laughs> so all of that so uh, the student would learn everything and then go back to uh, and and would also serve the guru and the guru's family so the guru is like guru's family is like the sort of a proxy parent during that entire time there was actually a ritual that we still do in many brahmin and uh, savarna like the people with caste privilege households where boys are sort of initiated into this teaching and that's why that's why the savarna castes are savarna is people who are within the caste system so th- those are rituals that only boys do women didn't really go to uh, or a fem didn't go to uh, a class so so it's not really that utopian ideal that you're talking about in terms of oh you know but and also that it really gave a very intimate personal relationship between the teacher and the student where it was a teacher really looked at what the student needed and what was the te- student's inclination and aptitude and then sort of really hone that and nourish that and so it was a and there's also been abuse in that relationship and which has been reflected in all the epics as well so it's not like we are glorifying something we it's also there's a glorification as well as there are things which are not really good in that system so this was also ta- this was also a way in which the brahmin and the kshatriya thing got kind of really encoded into the yogic way because the people who could go there were people with the ca- in the caste system were in the varna structure there were brahmins kshatriyas and maybe some really rich 
merchants who could be there. Uh, so the people who were outside the system couldn't. Uh, the Dalit people, the, the Adivasis. And so there are many stories in the epics which actually talk about that, which actually talk about, like, for example, in a, a tribal boy, Ekalavya in the Mahabharata, really wants to learn from one of the best teachers, the teacher of Arjuna and the Pandavas. And he really wants to learn from them. And he goes to him and he gets refused. He's like, you are a tribal boy. I can't teach the princess of the land uh, along with you. So there is, and it's a tragic ending to, uh, to the story. So it was a reflection that these struggles were happening, these conflicts were happening, these encounters were happening between the caste privileged and the caste oppressed even back then. So yeah, so a Gurukul is a really a great idea, and has the has, has all the all the you know the frailties of a great idea when it actually gets operationalized and manifested, as well as the beauty of it. So it's all of that. And another thing that I found really interesting to learn about, and is somewhat of the opposite of my original perception of how yoga was uncovered and explored like the idea I had was that a rishi like a sage would go to the forest or go to a cave and kind of observe nature and meditate or maybe learn from the feet of a teacher and then contemplate and integrate that knowledge however it seems that actually like debates were very much Mm -hmm. of the formation of yoga philosophy would you Mm -hmm. like to share about the vada vidya and how much discussion and disagreement and even conflict really shaped these ideas? You have done your homework, Joe. I have to say, good job. You made it easy for me because you share all of this information in a very accessible way. I love it. Um, Yes. So conflict was really important and has been important in the creation of the the teachings. And like you said, the Vada Vidya is um, part of the debate systems that were actually hosted by the kings of the land. And they would invite all these scholars and sometimes kings themselves and sometimes queens and sometimes ascetics of all kinds of genders would go and then they would debate like really deeply uh, esoteric points in a scripture or a philosophical concept. And then whoever won and all of the things that emerged from that debate would be added into the learning, you know. So um, that was a big part of the traditions and conflict. I mean, other than that, other than the whole Vada Vidya piece of it, there's always been conflict in, in quote unquote yoga or, uh, or a spiritual tradition. And when it comes to yoga, there were always not very pleasant conflicts. It didn't really get resolved and it kind of created a lot of bad blood between people and it created a lot of you know violence between people where people would would say you know my god is the right one and my god is the right one. so between especially from Vaishnavites and Shaivites people who worship Vishnu and Krishna and people who worship Shiva a lot of conflicts even Buddhist and Jain kings who were you know quote unquote more uh, peace loving were not necessarily only only that they really wanted to protect their land from outside religion, outside religions and outside faith traditions. So there was, there's always been conflict. There's always been clashes between religions. Sometimes that added to it, like, like I said, in a debate or whatever, but in, uh, in sometimes it was absolutely violent and harmful. And of course, I mean, if you look at it, even if any part of Mahabharata, I, I, which I absolutely love and I'm kind of obsessed with, you know, the the stories in there, because that is actually a book of conflict. It is a book of how to be in a right relationship. And what does that really mean? How complex that is? What is dharma? And everybody questions about what does it mean to be good? What does it mean to be right? What does it mean to do good? What is the right conduct? Like all those questions keep emerging in those texts. And nothing is very simple. Everybody is not nobody is just a complete hero or a complete villain there are shades of both in all of them all the characters so conflict was a part of life and i think what we are missing is what are the in the world right now is that we're really not first of all understanding conflict we are not really comfortable with it we try to shy away from it we're like oh oh, i'm going to talk about conflict in my yoga space my yoga space is all about you know peace and 
so that that creates a sort of dissonance uh, for many of us whose whose lived experiences are very conflict ridden just by our our positionality of being in a certain body you know or a certain lived experience so for us our life is about figuring out how to navigate conflict and then you come here and then you're supposed to not do any of that or not express any of that so there is a sort of a dissonance and a discomfort when we are talking about conflict in the modern world and forget about even being in a yoga space but even in general in the popular culture nobody really wants to talk about it because everybody's scared or of either messing up or saying the wrong thing or not knowing enough or you know all of the things so i think that is one of the big part of the world that really needs to figure out how to be in conflict in healthy conflict and to not want to just solve the thing you know we need to be like okay this is a conflict that has gone back centuries so really let's look at the roots of it and see what has happened and hold hold the complexities of so many different people's lived experiences right so i think teachings of the yo- of yoga are so beautiful that can help us get more real about about conflict self massage can be a wonderful addition to your yoga practice especially since it's not focused on strength or flexibility it's really all about getting to know your body and feeling better We love the Markaloo, which is a set of nested domes on a wooden base that you can use for self-massage and developing proprioceptive awareness. It's such a great portable and accessible tool that really opens up new movement possibilities. The Markaloo is also a fantastic addition to chair yoga, and since the domes all contain magnets, you can even stick them to your fridge or another metal surface like a chair frame. This is really helpful for anyone who has difficulty getting down on the floor or anyone who wants a visual reminder to take some time for movement and self-care during their day. The domes have been designed to support arthritis and peripheral neuropathy and they look like a beautiful little sculpture. You can use our discount code MACFLOW M A K F L O W to get 10% off at markaloo.com and help support the podcast. I think as well it really comes into like a himsa is the term that I see this in the most where sometimes it's interpreted in a passive way of like avoiding harm or avoiding violence but then I also see it shared as like no this is an active practice and you have to actively work to like fight against harm and violence against oppressed people or animals or even the mm. environment like it's an active practice not just avoiding that uncomfortable situation but like right. what can i do in my small way to help make things better yeah absolutely absolutely and i am so i mean you know i always say this that it's funny or, or rather ironic but i am so was never about a person uh, doing harm to another person it was uh, i am so started from doing harm to an animal mm. it was it was a concept that was brought by ascetics uh, who were increasingly critical of the vedic sacrificial offerings of animals like cows bulls and horses and it's funny that none of us are even talking about ahimsa when it comes to animals anymore much but we are to- definitely talking about ahimsa as in oh i i am just like i'm not going to create any harm i'm not going to say anything i'm just going to be this peaceful person and i'm not going to do anything you know so that's that's just actually creating a a passive plea but staying silent is a harmful because you're really up, you're li- really not disrupting or naming the harm that is happening in the world around you and we're seeing it so much now with the conflict in palestine and how different people from different yoga backgrounds are responding to that and even reconciling that in your own life where there's not that much you can do to help where you are now but it's this kind of heavy cloud hanging over all of us in some ways that obviously yeah. I'm a very safe distance from it yeah yeah no absolutely i think you know in uh, in terms of gaza and what's happening there in rafa i i don't think in we as human beings are have ever actually witnessed something happening live we're not we are witnessing a genocide happening live like on our phones like you open up open up a phone you see like 
oh my God, like the horrors that you're seeing and being a witness of it. I don't know whether we are capable of like processing that much. So people are either, I think either in, and they should be even just witnessing that in like our nervous systems are like either completely turning off or we are in a flight and fight thing. And so I don't know what the impact will be on our long-term psyches and for the next generation who are growing up thinking that this is what is normal. Like, how is this even normal? Like we are seeing children and we're seeing, it's like terrible. So I don't know whether how we can really wrap. I'm still figuring that out. Like, what do we do? Where do we go from this space? And what is the role that each of us have? What is the responsibility that each of us have given our own lived experience and social backgrounds? Yeah, it's a pretty complex world. I think, uh, I hope we have we have learned we are learning how to be empathetic and compassionate no matter who we are and moving from that space of being interconnected that though these though people who don't look like us are do are going through that i have somehow contributed to this in some way you know so i am still holding all of that yeah And I actually have found a lot of the stuff that you've written and shared really helpful for my own understanding and navigation and how can we look to philosophy from thousands of years ago to like deal with the problems that we're still facing as humans today on an even greater scale. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, that, I, that's my only, I would say vision for myself in some way or vision for the teachings of yoga, I would say more than myself it's the vision for like thinking about yoga as being very relevant to the times that we live in and bringing those aspects of yoga which are relevant to the times we live in so that's why i talk a lot more about conflict than the mudra and the you know because i know that that's wrong but i think each of us have our own inclination toward the part of the teaching that calls to us and for me that i feel that this the, in the teachings of yoga, there is such a wealth of information about how to deal with conflict, how to deal with violence, how to deal with, you know, the complexity of the human experience, the 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 psychology of each other or, or and ourselves to how are we creating this system? What is my role in the system? How do I navigate this this dichotomy of you know, being safe in in a home with everything and then looking at my phone when they, people have nothing and are, you know, in a rubble. Like, how do I even wrap my mind around it, right? I mean, it's kind of like sometimes just very, very hard to even like do that. And we, yet we shouldn't look away, right? I mean, of course, we have to take care of our own needs. Uh, otherwise, we all will get burnt out and really be no effective in anything. But at the same time, the teachings are the things that are really keeping it together on good days for me. <laughs> there are bad days too, where I'm like, oh my God, this is horrible. And I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what is, what, what the hell is going on. <laughs> so it's, it's all of that. Just to slightly change direction, another interesting thing that I've learned from you, and this is from your conversation with Dr. Padma Kamal, and please yeah. correct me on her last name if needed, on the Love of Yoga podcast, um, I especially enjoyed your exploration of non-binary thinking or mangalam or mangala in Sanskrit. Would you like to explain a little bit more about this really interesting concept? Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know what the word she used or I use. I don't remember the word exactly. But basically, non-binary thinking is we are conditioned to think in binaries, right? That That is de- a deeply entrenched samskara, the good versus evil, the, the binary of gender, the binary of experience, the binary of value systems. That has really formed a lot of our education systems, our everything, like all our systems, all our institutions. So. But life is not really binary. Life is actually more about uh, everything in between, right? None of us are entirely good. None of us are entirely bad. We're all, we're all just all of it, right? So re- to really, whenever you, even history, if you really study history, it'll disrupt all the binaries that you have. And because you will see that, for example, even the colonizer and the colonized, it is not a binary. Appreciation, appropriation is not a binary. 
the colonizer, in, especially in India, when British came in, the people who really helped them first to really gain a stronghold were the people of India, who were the people, for example, the ruling, uh, the elites of India, and and not you know, not all of, not all of them, but a lot of them, right? And we, even within the people who were revolutionaries or who were who were anti-colonial activists. There also was a lot of Brahminical patriarchy within those people. And there was a lot of conflict between, for example, Gandhi and Ambedkar, right? Gandhi is this supposed beacon of anti-colonial work and Ahimsa and all that, but he was a very complex person and he is not he's very cr- criticized and rightfully so by people who are Dalit and, uh, for example, Dr. Ambedkar. So... When you study history, it really disrupts the binary of who's good and who's bad and really understand the complexity of the of a situation. So I think that's what Dr. Padma Kemal, because she is an art historian, she was talking about she her, her work basically traced the Tantra goddesses of Chidambaram, I think, a place in uh, Tamil Nadu. And so that's the context that she was sharing that People who took the things away, took the goddesses, the statues away, were not necessarily only the colonizer. It was also the people who were off the land who had who either sold it or stole it away or, you know, all of those things. So I think that's what she was referring to. I don't know what, what word she actually used uh, to actually go back and read us, hear that. But that was a fascinating conversation. I actually listened to her in a museum here and I was like fascinated. And in fact, she was one of the big inspirations why I wanted to do my PhD. I went to her, I'm like, I want to do my PhD. She's like, okay. <laughs> so yeah, I think binary thinking is one of the biggest problems of humanity. I, you know, it's, it's reflecting here in the US. I don't know where, where are you both located? Australia. Australia, yeah. So here in the US, we have like a bin- two party system, mostly, right? Republicans and the Democrats. So again, you have to choose. So both of them are horrible. Now what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it's the same thing even in India. We have we have the BJP and we have the Congress. Those are the two big ones. There are all lots of other ones. But those are the two big ones. So then everybody, everyone is like, this is really bad and this is really bad too. So let's let's choose the lesser evil. So the same thing here. You know, I'm seeing this everywhere that it's that binary thinking that has manifested in all the realms and all the dimensions. And that's really impacting our life in every way. And the way to this, you know, I always say this, whenever you encounter a binary, then you have to stop yourself and say, oh, wow, I'm reacting in a binary way. I'm saying this is wrong. You know, she's wrong. He's wrong. I, you know, I'm right. So as soon as those things come up in your own psyche, just stop. Really take a breath, <laughs> you know, really practice your yoga and all the teachings and the asana or whatever it is, right? And examine that, examine where you're getting this binary from, who is, what is the root of the binary? And, you know, that really will take you down a path. And there's like a connection back into like dual and non-dual philosophy as well, right? Because is, it, is the yoga sutra is kind of where that dualist thinking is starting to become more and more mainstream yoga thinking, whereas the earlier times, like the Upanishads and the Vedas, was more non-dual and kind of defining self and other or self and higher self in different ways. Yeah. Ooh. So the Vedas and the Upanishads had both Dvaita as well as Advaita. It had dualistic and non-dualistic and many others, like Vishishta Advaita. It had like qualified non-dualism. So it's it's like a whole lot of things. But to go back to your question about the Yoga Sutras, I don't know whether that's the root of our binary thinking, but that is definitely a dualistic form. But eventually even that dualism dissolves, right? I mean, the point is that there is no dualism after that, right? The point is that we real, we the whole thing is that when we realize we are purusha that we are consciousness and everything else is a manifestation of that that energy is or spirit or whatever that is what we call, want to call it that is the ultimate true nature so that is the ultimate teaching of the sutras i don't know whether that has created a binary but i think we think of it as in a binary because we are conditioned to think of it as matter and spirit so, but it's really hard for our psyches to not take it in a binary way. So I think what, what I like to uh, like e- 
sort of give a example is like salt water, right? There is salt in this water. It's a very salty water. You, for, uh, but it's it's when you look at it, it's the same thing. It, there is salt and there is water though. It's like a mixture, and it's t- it tastes like only only when you taste it, you realize that it is salty. So the salt is the sort of the you know the uh, spirit and it's it's there in it and it has dissolved in in the matter right it is a part of it it is integrated in it so it's not two things it is one thing you know so eventually the dual, dualism of the sankhya philosophy which which is a part which is the, the underlying philosophy of the yoga sutras is 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 goes toward non dualism you know no, that's a great that's a great answer and as you were explaining that i was also thinking about how i'm only ever reading a translation of the yoga sutra because yeah. i don't read yeah. sanskrit so i'm also reading the bias or the way that that translator even if they are looking for words to express the meanings that they need that don't necessarily exist in english so it has yeah. to be simplified or it has to be kind of you know, the yeah. nearest possible translation if that yeah. word just isn't in existence. Absolutely. I think the translations, not only in English, but yes, English is a totally different, what do you say? It has a different root language, right? I mean, it's uh, Sanskrit, uh, at least if you're reading it in like, say, for example, Hindi or regionalish language, you kind of like get a sense of it because the some of the root words in Sanskrit and Hindi or, uh, you know, are somewhat the same. So I... Uh, I think language plays a huge role in our understanding of it, and the language has formed a part of our 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 thought process. So it's really hard to kind of distinguish. Yeah, and this kind of takes us way back again because another thing that I really appreciate you sharing on, which I don't hear so much about, well, definitely in my teacher training, is how many different religions, including Buddhism and Jainism and Sikhism, have all influenced and drawn from yoga philosophy and all have their own take Mm -hmm. on these philosophies would you Mm -hmm. like to I mean it's a massive question but would you like to (laughs) unpack a little bit of that because I think it kind of goes into this same sense of there are all these different frameworks of viewing these teachings and there's all these commonalities as well Mm -hmm. yeah so I I so again, another analogy, I like giving analogies because it kind of makes it somewhat simpler and accessible. I look at like uh, yoga as an ocean, right? And yoga is like the primal ocean. It's And it has like touched upon different shores. And the shores are different time periods, different developments of society, including different religions. So it has taken in those elements and then it continues to flow, right? So... Re- Yoga was predating of any religion. There was no religion at that time. This was the, when we talk, when I, and again, we have to be very clear about what yoga even is. What is, well, when you're talking about yoga, what are we really talking about? So yoga is, is again, a very syncretic thing. It's, it has taken in elements of the Harappan civilization. It has taken in principles from the Vedas about consciousness and matter and life and death and karma and, all of that from the Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita is all the other things like the Bhakti and Bhagavad Gita is a distillation of the Upanishads. So it's taken all these elements and then then starts the more of the formulation of the religions, uh, what we consider as religions. Hinduism is now not considered a religion at all. It was considered a religion only like at the 18th century onwards because of colonization. So that is there. Then, it, then the Islam influence comes in. Islamic rulers were some of the first people who translated the Yoga Sutras and the Upanishads in Ur- Persian. And so that, and then there's a Sufi thought of, you know, alchemizing love and love for the divine and all of that. So that has been very influential. Then there is also Christianity that comes in later with, with its own paradigms for example, the Theosophical Society that comes in in the uh, 18th century, which talks about the body and spirit and all of that. So all it has always been a porous thing. Uh, also, we have to hold it that that there were people who could change something. Who are the people who can change something? They're the ones who have agency. They're the ones who have power. They're the ones who decide, okay, 
I can do this and this is legitimate, right? So who are the ones who can who can give that legitimacy are the people who have power. So we have to hold that as well. So yeah, yoga is like this vast, vast ocean, pre-organized religion that has taken in elements and has given elements of the teachings to different religions. And of course, I, I did not mention Buddhism and Jainism, but Buddhism and Jainism were the most influential in creating the teachings of yoga. The teachings of the Yoga Sutras are highly influenced by the teachings of Buddha. Or, you know, people say it's vice versa. But when you really look at the uh, the, the history, it is the Shramanic, Shramanic traditions, the renunciate tradition that really created a lot of the teachings of yoga, which is, and they did not really get affiliated to any religion. They were a part, some, some were and some were not, because they really radically rejected any religion identity or a caste identity. So Buddhism and Jainism were one of the biggest influences of early yogic traditions. And how does comedic yoga fit into this mix? Hmm. So comedic yoga, I, I, I'm not an expert. My ex, my expertise lies basically in, or rather my studentship lies ma- mainly in this traditions or, or histories of yoga. So I really don't know much about comedic yoga. I can say that I will, I'm not surprised that there are overlaps of traditions between Africa and, you know, the Indic region, because there was a lot of trade, there was a lot of exchange, cultural exchanges between the two regions back 3,000, 2,500 years. So I will not be surprised that they also have systems and traditions very similar to the the practices that we consider as the Indic yogic traditions. So that's all I can say. I don't, I'm not an expert in, in Kemetic yoga, so I can't really comment on the nuances of it. Yeah, I actually, I'm, I would love to learn more because just everything that I've seen, like some of the illustrations just seem yeah. to align so much with yogic physiology of the body and even just diagrams of postures that look just like yoga. And again, it's like something that's just not really part of yoga education in a lot of trainings. And maybe there's just not a lot of written information about it. And that's one of the yeah. reasons, or maybe it's kind of cultural erasure as well could be and i think you know see the word yoga itself is is rooted in a culture right it, the so i don't know whether i would i would call what kemetic uh, that as yoga because of that yoga itself comes from a certain culture and a land and region and a history you know so but, and they they i'm sure kemetic yoga has a lot of those elements and vice versa i, I don't know the and I think a lot of it is, like you said, it is because of colonization in Asia and uh, being oral traditions. But hopefully they will, all of us will see that, you know, the overlaps and the exchanges. I think there's so much richness when people have discovered something together or at the end of the day, all of us are looking for pathways out of suffering and understanding what we are doing in this world you know what's the purpose and meaning of life or all of that so I think yeah I don't I don't feel particularly in any which way there are people who are like oh you know this is not yoga that is not I don't really have that I'm like as long as we are understanding of the histories and respectful of the histories and the ways in which it has changed or evolved and understanding the power dynamics and being critical of all of that not not really taking it all for at face value, really understanding something and being dedicated in our practice. It's all good. And that's such a such an aspect of yoga. It is. Like exploring ideas and looking deeper and not just taking something at face value, like always looking for more layers. Exactly, exactly. Being in a space of inquiry, you know, I, I've been thinking about this and maybe I'll post it sometime, that really what we are, what we should do more is to stay with the questions, to be it, be in inquiry rather than wanting to just jump to an answer and be solidified. Just stay with the questions because those questions are something that are the ones which are really going to reveal deeper layers of our own existence, you know. 
And another thing that I've like seen you share about as well that I'm really interested in is this whole other stream of physical practice for a spiritual or a mental or an emotional goal with like a really shared philosophy, which is your dad's mm-hmm. practice. Would mm-hmm. you like to share a little bit about how the history of dance and yoga are so intertwined and how it's what it does for you? Oh, boy. So dance and uh, and the teachings of yoga have a so, sort of a common root in the Vedas and the Upanishads where a lot of the cl- dance forms sort of emerged. And then the, uh, the dance forms in India and Pakistan especially were a part of the Natya Shastra, which is the book the big book of all all kinds of things, really cool things. When where music emerged, music came came into, you know, more of a codified way. And it's such a complex, complex system with so many different variations. So for me, the dance is a way of really being in my in my body. I haven't I don't dance actively right now. My daughter is. I'm actually gonna go meet my friend who was my dance teacher, who's a Kathak dance teacher. So I am involved in the community in different ways, but I've learned three kinds of classical dance. And that was for me a way of really connecting to bhakti. That was a really, um, I, I'm not a very religious person. I'm much more of a rebel than ever since I was like, I could talk, I think, much to the dismay of my mom. So dance was really the way I could really connect to spirituality in some way because it was an expression of deep connection and resonance with spirit in whichever form and beautiful language and poetry and all of that. So for me, dance is really a connection to my roots, cultural roots and and a spiritual tradition, I would say. Beautiful. And I love how it's like we've spoken about how some lineage is the wrong word, but a lot of the history is masculine and a lot of that recording was done by men. And it seems like dance is perhaps a way of passing down this information and these practices that's more for women by women. Like you're sharing Mm. it with your daughter, you're meeting with your teacher who's another woman. It's like a very beautiful community of sharing. Yeah. I mean, uh, yes, because a lot of the dances were developed by women in temples. So they were offerings to the deity. So Katak, for example, was, was was a way of telling the stories of Krishna, narrative, oral accounts, as well as then music and dance and then dram- dramatization. So yes, it is a little bit fa- uh, more gender expansive because there were also like a role play and then there was like a woman dresses a man, a man dresses a woman, then there's a trans people there, there's all kinds of experimentation happened and it was far more in that sense egalitarian. But this patriarchy in every art because it is so, you know, what do you say, extensive. So it has seeped in everywhere. And I think it also, I, I also choose people who are a certain, uh, of, of, of a certain sensibility. So that's one of the reasons why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, <laughs> Sorry, um, I, I know I've been very quiet during this conversation, but yes. I've, I've, I've just I've, I've just been stupefied. Yeah, stu- stu- oh, I'm fascinated by just the the, the complexity and the and the. I know I just find the whole history and and the interrelatedness of everything so fascinating, which is going to make this question I'm about to ask uh, maybe so difficult to answer <laughs> because I'll, I'll, we ask this at the end of every episode so if you could I guess distill everything that you've learned and everything that you teach down to <laughs> one core essence what do you think that one thing would be or, or what would be a good starting point for people who really want to delve into this area and learn about this complexity hmm I, I uh, can I go back to a imagery like a metaphor for this? I would say consider yoga as a tapestry, like a colorful tapestry full of different kinds of threads, and uh, some of them are really pretty and beautiful and shiny, and the other ones who are sometimes not the most comfortable, right? And then there are some which are very rough and not very. We don't want them, but they are there. But they're probably the ones which we really want because or need because they're the ones which give us warmth, right? 
So, and then there are some which are invisible, like they're really tiny, tiny, but they're there throughout the tapestry, right? So I would say, I look at yoga as a tapestry, like a colorful, multi-textured, big, warm tapestry. So I would say, start looking at one thread and see how that thread goes through the tapestry. And that would really lead you to a lot of, lot of insight. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love that analogy. And I love all of your analogies. Like it definitely <laughs> helps to find a way to wrap your brain around so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm all about imagery. Like because <laughs> I'm a very tactile person. So I like to like I, I think that this are these some of the most like esoteric, abstract teachings. So it's really hard for people to and including myself. So I like to like think about things in in a certain way. Wonderful. Thank you so much for everything you've shared with us today. Well, I'm glad to have had this conversation. And I think we touched on all all your questions. Your questions were amazing in the sense you've done your homework. And I really appreciate that. I love it. (laughs) We really hope you enjoyed our conversation with Anjali. We've put all of her social media, mailing list and website links in our show notes on our website, podcast.flowartist.com, if you'd like to learn more. And again, a quick reminder that we'd love it if you could write us a quick review on Apple Podcasts or leave us some stars on Spotify. This is a great way to help others find the podcast and show your support. We also love hearing from our listeners and finding out what you enjoy about the podcast. We also really appreciate it when you share our posts about each episode or leave us a comment online. You can find us at the Flow Artist Podcast Facebook page or look for Ran Loves Yoga or Garden of Yoga on Instagram. We are a DIY operation and your community support really helps. Special thanks to our Patreon supporters. Your donations help us cover editing and hosting costs and we appreciate you so, so much. You can even join our Patreon for free now to get all of our latest updates. Just go to patreon.com slash flow artist podcast. We'd like to express our gratitude to Go Soul for granting us permission to use their track Baby Robots as our theme song. Be sure to check out gosoul.bandcamp.com to discover more of their incredible music. Once again, thank you so much for spending your precious time with us. We appreciate you more than words can express. Here Aroha Nui Mawakia Koto Katoa, sending you Big, big love.